Thank you for tuning in to Circling Dialogos and my conversation with Johannes Niederhauser. Most of you are probably familiar with my previous discussions with Johannes, but Johannes is a, um, a Heidegger scholar and a philosopher and an author. Um, he's, his, uh, the book that he has out is, is on Heidegger and death, which is a phenomenal phenomenal piece of philosophy and he is also started something called the the Helkiant Guild for which I am a part of and he has moved all of his teaching from the university to doing online courses which um which have an alive that aliveness to them that I would imagine that the that the university courses probably wouldn't allow or afford so we are in, in this, and he's got a class coming up, I believe the 22nd of January, um, on being in time, Heidegger's work being in time. And so this conversation, we go deep into being in time and discuss a, a bunch of things in the book. But where we kind of settled, right, I would say about midway through the conversation, we settled pretty deeply into exploring Heidegger's notion of authenticity. And that part was the part of the conversation in which I was surprised at um, the different view I was starting to have about authenticity via Heidegger. I found it to be quite powerful. So I hope you really enjoy the conversation. If you're if you're interested in any part of this, I really encourage you to, to sign up for his course coming up. I believe it's the 22nd of January. The all the link for his class is down in the show notes. Also, for some more housekeeping, I'm really pleased to announce that the next Circling Dialogos um, is coming up. The the course I teach with John and Christopher, John Verveke, Christopher. It's going to be February 4th and 5th. That's February 4th and 5th, circling into Dialogos, where we go um, into the ecology of practices, everything from meditation to philosophical contemplation to, to, to circling to the final kind of culminating practice of dialectic in the Dialogos. This will be, I believe, our fifth course that we're teaching together. And we're constantly fine-tuning it and and um, changing things around and refining it. And it's a work in progress. So come and be a part of the process. It's really quite extraordinary. And the people who show up for these courses are just amazing. Just amazing. Okay, so that's February 4th and 5th. Um, if you are interested in working with me one-on-one -on -one for personal coaching and counseling... Um, how that works is just go ahead and email me. It's guysanksock at gmail.com. Um, my email is also down in the show notes. And what you want to do is just email me and let me know that you're interested. And what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll set up a time to, for an exploratory session where I can, we can sit down and talk about it and go over price and everything that's entailed and see if it's a fit. Also, if you are interested in exploring circling, we have drop-in events every Thursday night. The link is below. That's 6 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time from 6 to 9 p.m. every Thursday. We also have weekend intensives. I believe the next one is probably in about like two or three weeks. Um, and we have the Art of Circling, which is open for registration. And that is our year-long training intensive. Um, there are There's a webinar down below to explore circling in more depth. Um, and there's also an example circle down below as well. It's the very last link on the page, I believe. All right, so that's all the housekeeping. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope to connect with you soon. Welcome back, my friend. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a while. Last time we actually we saw each other was in was was actually in person and um it turns out you're you and all of alkiam guild is like a foot taller than me 
was like when I met you guys at the bar, I was I was surprised at like how far I had to look up. Um but welcome. And you're 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 about ready to open a uh well no registration is already open if I understand it correctly for a class yeah. being in time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good to see you again, Guy. Yeah. I I, I still have the a backlog of content uh guy and i recorded something in, right next to westminster alley mm -hmm. in july which is waiting like videos that i recorded in paris in may that's right this year. That's right uh, so that there, there's a backlog so that will come out we talked about memory etc and and other things uh, so the Briefly, maybe <clears throat> just on the technicalities of the course before we mm -hmm. start getting into the question of being and being in time, which is very often forgotten, right? It's striking that being in time is taken to be a book of anthropology or existentialism, etc., or social philosophy. So it's been a catastrophic, it has a catastrophic uh, history of reception. It is probably the most catastrophic <laughs> of all. And he gets very in, in the in the early notes of the so-called black notebooks about 1929, 1930, he's just he's struggling through this terrible thing that's come with it and how it's no everybody said how it, it the, the question itself was not really didn't really get through to people. Well, it is a book on the question of being. Yeah. And not on some one or Dasein doing something in his life, or even though that's also crucial, but for reasons that maybe we can also get into a little bit. Yeah. So the course treats of <clears throat> being in time, we discuss some of the, or I would say all of the main themes, which is the methodology of phenomenology, what is, what is ontology according to Heidegger, who is Dasein, uh, what is Dasein's being, for, for example, care, how, uh, one of the themes that will emerge from the course is the attempt at a transformation of the human being. Mm -hmm. So to try and transform the human being to move away from the rational animal or out of subjectivity also and cast, throw the human being as it were really into thrownness, into being in the world, which is not a state, but which is the, sort of the, the, the fundamental enactment of Dasein itself as, as soon as it is and as long as it is. We'll discuss, of course, truth and aletheia and ecstatic temporality. Also often strikes me as odd is that, uh, yes, being, maybe we discuss being, but and time seems to be very often forgotten. Uh, yeah. Ecstatic temporality will be quite absolutely crucial. Mm. And out of uh, death, as I mentioned before, being towards death and uh, Dasein's Geschichtlichkeit, let's say, for ease of understanding now, <clears throat> historicity mm -hmm. and i think that more or less being in the world obviously all these phenomena and that covers the 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 entirety of the book and i'll, I'll say this now briefly the the seminar start on the 22nd of january of 2023 so next year we'll meet for 10 weeks a uh, guy will come a couple of times whenever he's got time uh, mm -hmm. to join in because i know you work at weekends often uh, we'll also discuss a film. I haven't decided yet which one by Terence Malick, however, very likely. Mm. Because there's so many films that have been really informed by Heidegger's uh, philosophy. Yeah. So that that was something we'll do. We'll, we'll take a break from reading. We'll discuss a film at the fifth seminar. And yeah, so the download link will be in the description of the video and anyone who wants to sign up yeah. is uh, more than welcome to come. Yeah. And anyone really. So if you've not read any Heidegger, if you come to this from circling, uh, if you've been reading Heidegger, it, so there's no prerequisite. The prerequisite is always to be open, right? And to be open, to be dislocated and dislodged. Because that's the beginning of philosophy. Yeah. The beginning of philosophy is what we call in, in, in German is when you become verrückt, which is usually you know, means to be crazy or mad. But uh, verrückt means to be uh, rück, rück, uh, so, so to be displaced, yeah. to be removed in a sense. So that schism that, that opens up between being and beings. 
Yeah. That's the beginning of thinking. And that's that, to hold open that schism. That's that's the task of being in time. Right. Um, and, and to hold it open after the collapse of metaphysics. So, you know, there's a, there's a, it's not, this is what maybe has been lost uh, in our understanding of, of of philosophy or the arts, etc., it's not none of this is arbitrary. I mean, there, you know, he doesn't sit down and think, "Oh, you know, what, what could I get funding for? Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the, what's the, yeah. what's the trend clicks. of the hour? Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let me look on. Let me look on Google. What's most searched for? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to write me a book on being in time. Yeah. Uh, let's mash together two things that no one has ever mashed together." But no, there's a there's a there's a very you know there's a clear necessity for it. Uh, maybe we can discuss that also a little bit. And and I want to bring that out. And at the same time, of course, as it is, being in time is a self investigation of Dasein, and therefore it can also become, of course, a self investigation of oneself. Even though that's not the primary intention of the text. Yeah. Now I shall fall silent. Yeah. It's a, forevermore. It's one of those when you talked about the schism or opening up that the the that the that ontological difference between being and beings and that's where it all kind of takes place is it i i would have to say that my venture into philosophy was actually reading being in time um i was a student in art school at the time my early 20s and a friend of mine had bought a book on on Heidegger and I saw it on his desk and I something about it was strange and I lived across the street from the Barnes and Noble and I was a poor student so I couldn't really buy the book but no one read you know no one read it so I yeah. in my so yeah. I go across the street um and and get strung out on coffee and just read big in time and I had no idea why I was reading it <laughs> right what I was actually reading but there was something strange. There was something very, very strange about it. And I think, I think it was precisely that thing that you were talking about, this kind of schism or this kind of strange um, way that even though I didn't understand all the terms, I didn't totally grasp why I was reading it or even what I was reading, there was, uh, there was some way that I, I felt implicated in reading it. And and I think what one of the things for me was I just remember seeing different, right? As I was as I was read it, like like reading it is like what it took to try to understand what he was saying had me look someplace so close to me, right? That on one hand is the most familiar, for my own like most fa familiar notions and presuppositions about like what I was and what the world was and what things were where and in looking there those very familiar things became kind of strange right and realized that they're really concealed and I hadn't seen that and that that kind of shaking right or breaking open um I would have to say, in my experience, it kind of transformed the way that I saw and it kind of transformed the way that I, I like I listened. Um, and that happened to be right at the time where circling started. And it was three. It wasn't until like three years later that I realized because what would happen is I would just read being in time and, you know, ferociously. And of course, nobody understood what I tried to talk about it, but no one would understand anything I was saying. Right. But I would read being in time and then I'd go and I would circle and work with groups and stuff like that and develop that. And then I'd come back and read being in time and I'd go back and forth. And I didn't necessarily see the connection between the two until three years later. I started to catch some of the kind of you could say the um, the terminology and the lingo that people were using in circling was were Heideggerian kinds of phrases or ways of say, saying things. And I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, really interesting. Because I, I, it was at that moment that I realized that, that what I was reading on one level was a kind of reading that was unlike any other kind of reading I had done up until that point, 
right? Which is, I think all the reading that I had done up to that point was basically reading to be informed about something. But this wasn't, you don't read being in time and get informed about something. You, my experience no. was, is like you kind of, you you have to, you you go through something in reading it. And the, yeah. right? And the place, the, the, the way that you kind of, these moves that you need to make with your mind and with, and, with your cognition and all these kinds of things and have you see the world differently. Right. And it's the, pro it was like something like the process of reading really opened, broke things open for me in ways that I don't think anything else could. It's in a sense. So yeah, the issue with being in time is let's say the no, issue is wrong, but what what one can get trapped in is that it's it's not social philosophy or anthropology. So we're not after social relations per se, and we're not after um, a description of a historical type of human being or so. But instead, it is by so still in the everyday or an average everydayness being still is active or shows itself. Mm. But what is now uh, necessary, and this is perhaps what you were sensing when you were reading it, is to open up the distinction between, let's say, the presence itself and that which is present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and presence itself, Anwesen, or Anwesenheit, is being. And in ordinary, everyday, average dealings that we that we engage in, being is at stake mm -hmm. as much as it is always the being of Dasein that is at stake, Dasein. And then something else that you described also comes to mind, uh, brings to mind a, a quote from Being in Time, where, and I have to paraphrase horribly, is that what seems to us, you know, what is familiar to us on TV, is the most removed from us ontologically. Yeah. So we, we are, in a sense, pre-ontological beings, pre-ontological meaning we have an access to the ontological, mm -hmm. and the ontic is what, what really puts, what gives content to the ontological. So the ontic can never be forgotten, the, the everyday, let's say. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's, there's, there's this back and forth between the ontic and the ontological, but what being in time is truly after is trying to articulate, as Heidegger would have it for the first time, a full ontology that yeah. now grounds itself on Dasein as being in the world, as care, as being towards death, rather than as the rest of modernity has done. And also, by the way, psychiatry, uh, biology, um, psychology, of course, we're staying in that, in that direction. It's, it's all based on, on an ontology of René Descartes, on the ontology of the subject that thinks of itself purely and ref self-referentially. And, in the, and only there's so, so many really strange remarks by, by Descartes where he speaks of, of an evil spirit and compares God to an evil spirit, of course, denying that God is an evil spirit. God would never deceive me. The world really is there. You know, the, the, the problem that modern philosophy runs into whether, whether the external world exists or not, it is, is one of the crudest ways in which the sort of the isolate the isolation of the subject shows itself. You know, the issue that we're facing is that we're all um, we're all basically living in this ontology. Our every single science is predicated on this. What Heidegger tries to do is to write a fundamental ontology based on our being in the world, being with others, which has nothing to do with authenticity. Right? So that's that's for something some other time too. But I think the the experience you describe in, in reading it is <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's it would be a mistake to pull out a single proposition from any point in being in time as oh he says he did this and then he says this. So there's a there's a contradiction. But instead, if one reads it in a genuine manner, what it does is it begins to take you out. So maybe you don't understand anything, let's say, in a you know like cognitive manner, 
or so you couldn't perfectly summarize it here you know in this paragraph he says this but no but instead what you begin you begin to hear differently you begin to see differently because it takes you out and i've, I've seen this with students when i used to teach at university um you know the course at university were also you know in england it's 10 weeks long at the end of 10 weeks i remember a student from italy uh, saying oh <clears throat> This has completely changed my life. Yeah. I was brought up to believe where economic units are uh, just you know perfectly isolated and were basically consumers. He studied what they call in England uh, PPE, philosophy, politics, and economics. But it is through just 10 weeks of, of reading being in time, being dislodged again. Dislodged because you, you, it's, it's only in this moment where you begin to ask, well, what, what, how is there something? Yeah. Why is there anything present at all um, yeah. that we that we move out of? It? And the text itself, as it were, does this. The text investigates yeah. this possibility, and the text, as such, also becomes the possibility for that stepping out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that that particular yes, in doing that in these in these you know hermeneutic circles over and over and over go. Yeah. And does in being in time relentlessly these kind of there's <laughs> right where where you think you think that i it, you know it's just kind of like there's a certain kind of drama to it almost uh, there's you know he lays out this most familiar thing in the world and then a page later he takes it and pulls the rug out from underneath it and you see it completely different right but and it's these moments of recognizing on one level this it's so straight it's so it's so difficult to talk about, like to to put this into words but the it, that these insights and these understandings that you come to in realizing this on one level they're like new but on another level there's something so familiar about them right and it's almost like it's almost like that which is unseen and concealed in its familiarity right in this way of investigating this phenomenal hermeneutic phenomenal ph phenomenological circles that you go through over and over and over again kind of in some sense open up this sense of familiarity that you never even knew to ask a question about right until you know it's almost like well, yeah he what he shows us or what we so you know, we actually have to, before I, you know, two things, there's always the issue, two things at once, and you can't, you know, say everything all at once. But mouth, in right. some sense, the, the way we are, oh, yeah, I need to, uh, the way we understand uh, a text usually, of course, is, is purely as information. Mm -hmm. So it, it gives you, you know, blah, 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 this is the definition of thoughts, and this is the definition of word, this is what I mean by being. Blah, 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 blah. But the text itself invites us to reinvestigate or reassess how what we mean by text. Yeah. So it's itself a hermeneutic exercise. Like any philosophical text, of course, is developmental. And you know, to say Kant uh, contradicts himself in terms of what a representation is when you look at the beginning and the end of the first critique is pointless. The <clears throat> the way in which so that that we read uh, is 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 also shifted so that we you know we don't get it's not normative so it doesn't tell us what to do it's purely descriptive but yeah. in this description it discloses something about what it means to be dasein now dasein is not a universal principle that's important to know it's not everyone is um, an, an individual that also belongs to that higher concept dasein no dasein is a and i will hammer this home you know uh, uh, until uh, until i don't know midnight but until the end of the course, every single time that Dasein is a horizon in which we participate. Yeah. That's how it can be ecstatic, historical, um, um, singular, mm -hmm. and also, for example, tribal, or as Heidegger says, primitive. So for Heidegger, every tribe that's human participates in the horizon that is Dasein in, in a different horizon um, from 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 perhaps Europeans or whoever or or Chinese uh, civilizations, but it, it's but they can still meet, not because you know it's a universal humanitas, yeah. but 
but because they participate also in the question of being yeah. that is accept that, that is temporal but that is very unique to everyone mm -hmm. so everyone has their horizon to um to look towards but can still meet all the other horizons and now on the other issue you brought up on familiarity as you say he pulls the rock from underneath us and mm -hmm. going through and so this so the examples of the everyday are brought in to show that in any encounter that we have for example, just something as simple as using the street lights mm -hmm. uh or understanding them even there's a certain understanding of of being must be active that's completely pre-ontological yeah. but it is nonetheless it's active and it's in it is being enacted by dasa yeah. so then he looks at what sort of presuppositions or conditions as well must must there be in place for that to work that's the leap as it were into the ontological but uh, what he then continues to to show is especially you know when we get into phenomena like angst and, and death um, is that the familiarity of the world mm -hmm. is unfamiliar yeah. it is precisely the familiarity of the world that is act that actually shows us how it is uncanny and that, that's what pulls the so he, he pulls away the familiarity and says you know, what holds up still yeah. and i think the the <clears throat> so yeah i would say that this is uh crucial to to see from from the beginning is that what we're after is a is an understanding um, not so much is through the everyday of the un, of the familiar that's also unfamiliar in the everyday and as that slips away that that ground disappears that seemingly stable foundation evaporates yeah. but as it evaporates the design is well it's sort of twisted free and this twisting free towards Dasein itself, so you know, to show that the subject object dichotomy doesn't hold up, um, that the world itself is not a receptacle into which we are placed, but a horizon um, mm -hmm. or a background. And that, so, or that truth, for example, is, is not correspondence between what I represent about the world and an object, but that truth is itself something that happens or takes place that allows for any encounter in the first place. Yeah. So while he pulls away everything familiar, yeah. he also provides a deeper layer, let's say, yeah. that grounds us in a new way yeah. so that we begin to understand our, ourselves and the world as, as taking place, as occurring, as ongoing, yeah, if, if you like, events or... So, so never, you know, never never you know here's the thing that is thinking that's me and there's the thing that is my body that i move with my thinking and there's all the other things mm -hmm. out there but yeah. it is it's continuously in the enactment so it, it becomes he actually tries to show us i think that what we seem to take as familiar to summarize this what we what we take as seemingly familiar is unfamiliar and doesn't hold up ontologically mm -hmm. right Right. But so it twists us out in a spiral movement out of the familiar that is actually unfamiliar to something much more familiar that is seemingly for now uncanny. Yeah. Yes, the, the, that it's really struck me when you said the the familiar becomes unfamiliar and that uncanniness, right, in some sense pulls out the rug yet some it also opens something up that we can and bring it to four and we can start to question it and understand it right that that thing that opens up that difference and that's i would have to say that that really does describe at least my own personal experience with with reading being in time and and that kind of a it, kind of awakening in seeing of just that that's even possible right was was it's just huge right because because if it, it you know if if you, all of our behavior, right, all of our actions are are completely coupled with perception, and so if if you shift how you perceive, or a shift happens in perception, right, there's going to be a shift in 
in the way that you respond, right, to to everything, right? So it's a kind of a it's a it's a it's a there's a way where it's like um like a deep reading and being in time really reading it is that you're one is really implicated <laughs> right in reading it. Yeah. So if you what I would suggest for anyone who wants to read the text, given what you've been saying, is and what I've tried to say maybe also is to is precisely not to read it as you know, I I want to understand what Dasein is. Mm -hmm. Okay, where's the question of being? Mm -hmm. I mean the entire text is is basically is four hundred pages spent on trying to articulate the very question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. and and that very question needs to be articulated, not because again, not because someone sat down and, and thought, oh, you know, uh, why not? But no, it, it there's a there's a, it stretches back to Plato for some reason. The Greeks were perplexed by it, but also addressed by it, the question of being, but at the same time they didn't it didn't rise itself to the to a well, yeah. Obviously, Aristotle writes on being, and uh, <clears throat> so does Parmenides, and, and of course also uh, uh, Plato. Um, and you can find so you know the Scholastics, Hegel, etc. Being is always at stake, but it doesn't rise, let's say, to. And for Heidegger, that's 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 the issue. It doesn't itself become a question. It is in some sense always taken already for granted. That's not to say that there was a mistake by the Greeks to take it for granted. Maybe it was granting itself. I mean, this is a nice expression in English to say it is, you know, to take something for granted. Yeah. I mean, if it's it's gifted in a sense, maybe being gifted itself, and hence it didn't become an issue. Yeah. It didn't become a question. I mean, there is a quote by uh, for, by Heidegger on from from Plato that you know, Right, right on the first page that even at that time there was a perplexion or a confusion about what being means mm -hmm. but still that didn't it didn't never it never translated really in the at least according to Heidegg in the tradition to a full uh, questioning of the question mm -hmm. and if we let's to, to simplify it if there's a certain exhaustion of, of you know now we talk about crisis back and forth. One crisis ends, the next, the next 10 are around the corner. Jean Baudrillard says in the 1980s, this system now manages everything by crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the 19th century, it really begins in Europe, this general widespread sensation or sentiment that something has ended. All of a sudden, something is over. Uh, the, 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 the notion of crisis is spreading everywhere another word for it is nihilism the death of god uh nietzsche Husserl, and others but what what heidegger attempts to do hence following Husserl, is as let's say the world disappears or the phenomena disappear he wants to go back to the phenomena themselves that's one of the tasks of being in time and in so doing, also holding up the, um, the, 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 the schism or the distinction between being itself, presence, and that which is present. And that's important because if you have the collapse of the two, you also have the collapse of thinking. What you are end up with is a, is a mere immediacy of one thing after another. You know, so the, to illustrate this, Plato's cave myth tells that story. As long as we're just looking at the shadows, which is taking them to be reality. Yeah. Once yeah. we move outside, and that's that's the image for the schism, to move outside, to leave, to break free, to you know, break from from, from the chains, but come back. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we begin to see the shadows as what they really are. So we begin to see that very presence that gives that gives presence to that which is presented there. Yes. So we're losing 
to make this you know understandable maybe more so we're losing reality mm-hmm. this is in a very vernacular sense we're using reality without that schism it is it disappears it just collapses into mm-hmm. one dimensionality of of the cave yeah. or the supposed one dimension of the cave so the reading to pick up on this again, I think, should be one that, of course, you have to take the tradition into consideration, etc. But at the same time, it speaks to us on such a fundamental level as to who we are <clears throat> that it it can be it can be read simply as we would read a, a, a text of meditation um, that we we don't analyze in terms of its propositional content but that we read in terms uh, so that we reach a certain moment in which mm, the world begins to you know, as you, you said you know there's a let's, let's say there's a shift in perception and something else that that we should also perhaps touch on is that what what there is a, a, a really a, a big shift in in Heidegger is a move away from the, the eyes or or, or seeing as the primal sense towards hearing and yeah. listening, hearkening back. Listening and hearing becomes the most important and the primal sense. And what's important? What would you say is important about that shift? What is it that the mode of hearing opens up, and in 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 particular, like in being in time as we're as we're talking about it, that maybe say seeing either doesn't open up or it it actually covers over what that what's important about that shift as you understand it so i'm oh sorry <laughs> okay i'm, I'm I, I thought I, I thought i was mute um so i'm 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 reading a, a quote which i i just read again and on, from being in time, hearing even constitutes the primary and authentic openness of Dasein for its own most ability to be, as in hearing the voice of the friend whom every Dasein carries with it, shows itself. Dasein hears because it understands. Mm. Mm. Dasein <laughs> hears because it understands. So that's to say Dasein hears because it understands means that Dasein is directed mm-hmm. uh, towards projecting itself towards its possibilities of being. Yeah. And <clears throat> what also, what's an important moment of this liberation that occurs in being in time is that possibility begins to be higher than actuality. Yeah. So we're, we're projecting ourselves towards possibilities or does and project itself towards possibilities, not to actualize them, but to and so there's nothing given. Mm. We we and I think um, hearing is is crucial because mm. it is. <clears throat> it's not to say that you know the eyes um, deceive us uh, as as so the issues of you know the back and forth. Here's the thing about philosophy. The back and forth is between realism and idealism. And there's different variations of it. And you may be familiar with this and maybe other listeners of your channel and and people who stumble upon this may have heard about the, the, the very successful European academic movement, which calls itself New Realism. Now, I've said this before, and I'll say it again. This will probably give way to a new skepticism uh, and and then ultimately to some you know if if there's anything still around in fifty years it, it'll be new idealism so <clears throat> and of course anything that has to announce itself as new is dead in the womb I mean that's just obvious you know so realism idealism after phenomenology actually has no place to be anymore because it is it's put to death it's put to to it's finally in the grave with Heidegger mm-hmm. and <clears throat> so that's a back and forth between what comes first. What's out there, the real things, or what's in there in the mind. And then you have, for example, one of the subspecies of idealism is rationalism, which completely disregards the senses. Descartes is, you know, it repeats itself again and again and again throughout the ages. Mm -hmm. So 
and this is not one of those moments here. This is not to say, you know, the oh, the eyes deceive you. Don't trust your eyes. No, seeing is very important. It's 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 we see with Heidegger, we can actually begin to see ontologically. Yeah. I think when we yeah. right and when we read it in a proper way for a bit of time and <clears throat> begin to, but that listening is a listening to language. It's mm -hmm. So we begin to listen to our words. We begin to listen to our fundamental words in a way that mm -hmm. <clears throat> that uh, that they open up something that we hadn't that we wouldn't have considered before. So when we read the text, we come back to this. We read the text. We actually have to listen to the text. We have to listen to the word. For example, entschlossen, usually translated as resolute, mm -hmm. but entschlossen also means disclosed. So. Um, or <clears throat> most famous example probably is, or even Dasein itself. Dasein means their being, the being of the, the there. Yeah. Or aletheia in the Greek, usually translated as truth. And then left over this initial meaning of unforgetting or unconcealment or disclosing, which carries with it at the same time. And then you have to allow for, oh, that there must be a, a simultaneity. And hearing is in... I don't know. It, it, you know, hearing is the it's it, it's it's the sense of of the equilibrium. Um, when you have issues with your ears, you lose your sense of equilibrium. It, it's it, it's it's in some sense very immediate, and and it, but it is it it goes right to the to the core, right? I mean, when we listen, also when we hear someone speak, and that's why we can listen to stories. We can listen to stories and. We begin to see images. We begin to see only through words. Entire worlds begin to emerge. Yeah, yeah. And so, by listening to our languages, and I think, of course, you know, obviously, we would have to say to be very precise in being in time. That's in some sense to talk like a scholar for a second. It's underdeveloped, but regardless of that, hearing begins to yeah. show itself to Heidegger as crucial because then we can listen to language itself. And how language discloses the world, how language really, in some sense, is the world. Yeah, 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 totally. It's and there's this kind of sense of where, as you're talking about this, it, it seems like it's a kind of listening that, um, you know, it's a it's it's interesting. It's like a listening. It's a listening to our language, right? And of course. All we've ever done when we've listened is listen to language, but there's another level that you're talking about where I think it's something, is it something like, something like I begin to listen to my very listening. Like I begin to listening, I, I begin to hear, and I would say that I haven't heard, <laughs> right? I start to, I start to hear my lack of hearing. I start to listen to my own listening as a as as part of the way that things don't and do disclose themselves right in some sense is that is that fair so that's a very important distinction in the beginning that you pointed out namely that in some sense we've you know what are you saying obviously we've only just been listening to language because we you know we're having this conversation and that's not uh we're not speaking right. in computer code or but that would be a language so yes, true, but so again, here comes in, I think, the schism or the distinction, the distinction between how we think of language, but then also what it is that language really enacts. Maybe language is, look, I'm currently in Italy. Mm -hmm. I'm German. I usually live in England. Mm -hmm. I speak a bit of Italian, speak a little bit of English, and, you know, some German sometimes. Mm -hmm. And in every language, I can only go as far. And I note and I know that I cannot say everything in English that I can in German and the other way around also. Mm -hmm. There are phenomena that cannot be described and that they cannot just be translated. Yeah. So that also, it's, a, it's the way in which the Italian language, you know, here's a, of course, you have the Sicilian dialect here. Um, and um, <clears throat> that there's all these differences between the dialects, but let's just say for overall, let's speak of Italian. 
the the way in which the language discloses the world here is different from maybe in Germany or in France or in England or in, in the US. And that, however, would mean to, yes, not to listen, you know, in some sense, to, not to listen to informational content to begin to see this. So what is he, you know, but to listen to, the, how did you put it? The listening of the listening or to listen to words and trying to try and articulate this. So, um, so we listen to a, a word itself and what it says to us. And as we listen to it, we have to allow for, again, the unfamiliar. We have to allow to hear something that we, that is unheard of. Yeah, you know that we have to, these expressions that you know they mean nothing anymore, and it's unheard of. But it, it actually means something. This un, something has remained unheard. It's not been it's not been listened to yet. Mm-hmm. So we begin to listen. Yes, to listening itself. To, to so we begin to to listen to the words themselves. They begin to speak. But we also listen to listening itself to which means to, to listen to that initial presence itself. And that presence, that's now it's slowly coming. That presence be- begins to shift. That presence becomes a different one than just, you know, just listening to you in a, oh, how was your day? My day was fine. And would you like coffee with your sugar? Just kidding. Uh, would you? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that was a very bad show. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but so, uh, the so we, it actually the, the presence itself shifts yeah. so so that and in that shift the as the presence shifts yeah then then there's the occasion for or the invitation for 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 a shift also in the way in which beings present themselves and i think that this is so strong in english it's completely, we say something completely different than in German. We speak of Anwesen, if any German listeners are here, but present themselves, you know, a present, as you know, is a gift. So there is a relationship in English between presence, being present, presenting itself. I mean, we hear in presenting itself, and we can also hear, oh, it begins to gift itself differently. So as long as we, for example, take language purely to be informational, which it also is, but this, it's not reducible to it and not ex, not exhaustible by it, then strangely enough, the world itself becomes pure informational value. Nothing gifts itself. Instead, it's all just standing there as a resource to be exploited and to be evaluated. Mm. Um, constant evaluation of everything, you know, mm. thumbs up, thumbs down. But here, if, if there's a shift in terms of the language and the seeing and the understanding of language, then also the way in which phenomena appear begins to shift towards a, a true gift of itself. And that's what we're after. After all, is for things to show themselves again by themselves yeah. without us or the human subject forcing something to show itself in a certain way. When you said there is a number of times, it's, it's interesting, every time you talk about um Present presence shifts. You go like this with your hands. What's presence shifts. This is, yeah, this is yeah. that's kind. Of, but it, 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 I, I think I point. I think I'm pointing that out because I think that's really quite. It's quite telling, right? That, that this these circles. Like, what's important about these? Because I my my, it's it's interesting. There is a, a thing of of. I'm going well right now. I'm going through and reading um, a Heidegger text that I've probably read five times, but I hadn't read in about five years. And I'm reading about, yeah. and as I'm re- as I'm reading it, I'm start to. It's like I start to hear things that I didn't realize that I that I had heard before, right? But I, it's almost like you. There's these. You keep circling around, and you could say I, I would say like you know, being itself in, sen- in some sense, it, is this... Well, he's carving. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> right, right. It is, it's, it's not, it's not just, it's not, it's it's not going, you know. Yeah. Oh, hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, like a madman, like a, like a goldfish. Oh, this is nice. This is, right. No, no. 
it's it's carving away and then one of the strongest examples i think of that is the question concerning technology because it's such a compressed mm. it's a public talk given to engineers mm. you know i wonder when you know i mean when we have engineers again ready to listen to something like this but anyway that's a different story so but this is he begins and carves it out but then takes two steps back and begins again from a different or that it somehow comes together uh, not somehow obviously there's a method to it or a me the method itself develops but yeah it's a, it's a carving i think the movement is ultimately if you want to have a name for it i think it's a, a spiral really that yeah. um that keeps going further down at, at the same time also we, we cannot visualize this but it, maybe it's like this up and down <laughs> yes <laughs> well, at the same time because i'm i'm i i i started carving some alabaster i don't know you can, you can even see it in this but it's these yeah yeah while i'm reading all of this stuff and all it is uh, it, i'm like it's exactly what you're talking about these spirals and res responding but there's but here here's the here's that part that i think the this kind of way of hearing right these deeper levels of where you start to hear um yeah what in hearing it you recognize it's been there in some sense the whole time <laughs> you also hear that you hadn't heard it that's something about yeah about the disclosure that's just really interesting it's, right and and what's absolutely crucial though about this there mm -hmm. is that it's and this is where again we have to understand that being in time addresses being and not beings not entities yeah. so it's not uh here is a cup mm -hmm. and it's hidden behind a phone no one can see the cup mm -hmm. phone is gone mm -hmm. here's the cup ah oh, i've discovered it was already there so instead because what we're addressing is precisely possibilities and not anything actual yeah. not real things if you like but purely the possible but also that which affords itself possibility mm -hmm. as you know in german möglichkeit has i mean möglichkeit comes from is related to posse to power to the possible etc so the, the translation is actually fine but uh, and we don't and we don't want to be you know too um like too close to the german either because it still has to speak in the english vernacular also but there is a sense in the german of möglichkeit that heidegger will get into later in his things after being in time where he connects it more to And affordance and a, a liking that's also here. Um, so something opens itself to us and and and, and affords itself again, gifts itself. Yeah. So I, I actually let me let me find let me try because it's it's so difficult to say this. Um just you know um just so so I, this is something I wrote for the for the course, and this is on Alithia, which is exactly on you know what I mean by there does not mean it's there as a thing that's available or has always been available but we just didn't see it but truth means as alithia always daseins being in the world as ahead of itself already concerned with directed towards this or that project projecting itself towards possibilities of yeah. da -da -da. and as such discovering not actualities but possibilities that is to say dasein discovers not what is already given or available, but possibilities in the plural thereof. Dasein is, insofar as it discovers and unconceals, not things, but possibilities. That is to say, different modes of being present. As Dasein, it's, it's a possibility of presence that's being discovered. Yeah, yeah. That, of course, invites Dasein to act and to enact and to you know to actualize if you like in a certain sense but the, what what affords itself is there is again all of a sudden this weird shift in 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 the horizonality yeah. that <clears throat> then opens up even more other possibilities yeah and of course 
Heidegger's project is one on the grandest scale because it's it's you know it's it's not Heidegger's language, but it's it's on a civilizational level really of trying to shift the entirety of how we understood what it means to be human. Yeah, it's a complete. It's not a break with it with the tradition, but it's a complete moving out of of this exhausted understanding of the human being as a rational animal. Which now, I mean, now now they you know some people call us hackable animals because we're just lumps of data that can easily be hacked. So you see how the, how this you know, the rational animal has become the hackable animal. If you need any more proof of the exhaustion of how we see ourselves, well, there it is. This was just said by someone three years ago. Right. So. So this exhaustion is is real. Anyone who's who's got you know, half there can sense it, yes. and uh, and who hasn't completely given up. Right. And so <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> but 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 even but even but even that complete carelessness is a response, and yeah. it's a response that that you know that that feeds back into if you want to use that sort of almost cybernetic language that feeds back into being itself. And comes back out again also. Yeah. So we're, as Dasein, we're always responding. We're always responding to a certain possibility. And what we're discovering as there really only comes about as there in that moment of it being discovered. It was there, let's say, as a, as a, as a possibility. Yeah. But only when we, we have to listen to it yeah. and then also be able to articulate it. Yeah, yeah. That listening articulation, yeah. right? In se- in some sense, I would say. I mean, I would say. It, it reading being in time, in some sense, is a. It, it it seems to me that that's what that text is continually doing. Is this? It's like this listening. There's a sense of a. A, a listening, articulating, right? Something that we're just beginning yeah. to hear, right? And come to articulation with it. And what I hear you saying is, is, is essentially like what it's the shift from this shift from being, being understood or misunderstood as a, as a being, as a kind of special thing or something like that. And therefore, completely misunderstanding it, right? Yeah. To something like um, being—I uh, don't know if we want to put it—being be, as the possibility of all understanding in some sense, right? And that, and that, because I think that's one of the things I really got to was—is is that we're always responding to our understanding of being. Right. Like you can't yeah. you can't move a, a, any kind of movement or any kind of response at all is always a response to a kind of pre thematic like sense of what anything is at all. Right. And that anything. Yeah. Is at all, right. And so if if you're if you just start to see or glimpse at or overhear or like listen and attune to that understanding itself and that you have an understanding yeah. of itself is the moment that you start to kind of, you start to kind of listen, something opens up newly and you keep, maybe you can, you, you can talk a little bit about this, about um, for people who aren't that familiar with the word horizon in the way that you're using it. What do you mean by these shifts in horizons and these horizons opening up, right? As you're talking about it, what, what do you mean by that? Horizon is a Greek word or comes from the ancient Greek and, and uh, the verb would be, the temporal word would be horizon, which means to limit. So horizon is is a limit. The Greeks have strikingly several different words for limit. Another word for limit is peras, which is where something begins insofar as it ends there. So, for example, the the way in which Hegel's science of logic 
ends with the idea, let's say with the absolute idea, but it, that doesn't enclose it in itself. It actually opens it up. Opens it up. So the idea is itself the paras. But the whole, the horizon is is um, a little bit different in the sense that here we we um, the the horizon is let's say is is also not really given. So it's also not you know oh there's the horizon and it's always there always been there how could it be any hmm. anywhere how could it be anyhow else no how could it be anywhere else no it's, instead the horizon is <clears throat> i would say is continuously arising there is at least a, a phonetical similarity or, or nearness between arising and horizon which i think very often is is um is ridiculed these um these similarities but i don't think that language is quite so uh, quite so serious as these uh, these hall uh, monet- monitors uh, of 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 the philosophy of grammar or so would have us believe. So, I think the the horizon is something that we is again is not given, but is continuously arising. But of course, that would mean also collapsing. So it cannot just only go up; it is also yes. coming down, collapsing, deflating. And it is doing so temp- in a temporal manner. Yeah. So in an ecstatic, I mean, yeah. not temporal. Again, if we if we stay with the traditional understanding of time, which according to Heidegger is linear, yeah. then we would know. But ecstatically emerging, so that what has been, yeah, pushes into the future as that which is to come. And that is already very horizontal. So there's the, the directedness of Dasein towards the future. Yeah. But as that which has been is not, you know, data and um, and the and, and it's not historical events, but it could be something completely that, that no one saw. Mm-hmm. So whatever comes to us from the future can still be completely unknown. Yeah. Also, at the same time, the future is, and that's a bit strange, is also at the same time open, precisely because it's not a closed process, if you like. Yeah. But it's 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 itself tearing open. Yeah. So yeah. the horizons are being torn into, into the fabric of being, if you like, and they become possibility backgrounds. Yeah. Against which, against which, beings present themselves in a certain way, yeah. as meaningful. Yeah. But but there's never just one horizon. Again, Dasein is not universal. There, there's a multiplicity. There's a let's say there's okay. I don't want to use language that's maybe too technical. So there's a multiplicity of horizonality mm-hmm. that is more fundamental than horizons themselves. So a horizon is in the simplest way possible I can say this. That's what Heidegger means by world. Mm-hmm. It's we are directed towards a horizon against which beings appear as meaningful. So the world is not a receptacle. It's not a, not a box. It's not a globe. It's... It's it's that an acting of the horizon itself. It's something that comes about temporally, yeah. and that can also at the same time collapse. And it could collapse while we're, for example, engaged in a certain project. The horizon of meaning can break away. All of a sudden, you don't see any more to break this down now to a bit you know, more vernacular terms. All of a sudden, you've been doing something. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. why am I doing it? What's what happened? Yeah. Well, the horizon has shifted, or the horizon has collapsed, and another one has shown itself. You may be able to find right. uh, the old one again, and it becomes meaningful again, or you have to make do with whatever now affords itself. But there are these moments when all of a sudden it becomes meaningless what we've been engaged in. Yeah, and See, that's a shift in horizon. Sorry, yeah, I can hear that kind of. I can hear that kind of horizon ground relationship of like, in some sense, it's the horizon that in in it gives the ground and if that horizon collapses or shifts or goes away, I'm now standing on a different ground. Is that fair? Or on no ground. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or I'm free. Or, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, and on the, on, yes. And then the, yeah, I mean, yeah, the ground is breaking away. I mean, mm-hmm. it has broken away. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and as it, so, 
And of course, you know, Horizon is also <clears throat> something against which it's not imminent. So I think Paris as 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 limit is is imminent, but in Horizon you have as you have this notion of, of it rising up or projecting towards it, there's also a hint at transcendence. So not transcendence towards another world or towards eternity, but transcendence to go over beings, to, to, to transcend. Transcendence, again, is in, as this verrücken also, this location, this sudden this moving out of the ordinary, seeing the ordinary as ex in an extraordinary sense and beginning to see the unfamiliar and the seemingly familiar and only in that way um <clears throat> also seeing other horizons so that's actually that's freedom right because you're you all of a sudden you say but i can and and you step out yeah and that's that's in that sense it's ecstatic yeah really literally in the sense of taking us out off right right so that yeah, it's quite, that's what it's, time, it's time, right. time, time of. Well, I think <laughs> what I'm hearing is not only is it not a transcendence that takes you to another world, but it's a, it's a transcendence that has you stand out, affording you to actually see more, or deeper where precisely you are. Right. <laughs> got these two. I mean, this, so yeah, <laughs> but this is this is the that's and I was, you know and this yes and 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 it's a in a civilizational. Uh, a uh, uh, moment in which we are, you know, well, let's go to Mars, and oh no, let's upload ourselves to the cloud. Oh, um, yeah, but that—that's that sort of silly, uh, childish transcendence towards yeah. another imagined fantasy utopia world. Yeah. Uh, instead of instead of moving out, which is what we let's say naturally do and engage in, but in, as you say, but in order to move back, right. but to move. To, to move back right. into it fully right. um, and, and not escape to yeah. the cloud or, right. you know. Right. So this is, so so this now we're starting to go, now now as we're starting to talk about the the, the, the time part of being in time. Yeah. yeah. And because and, there's what, I know there's division one and then there's division two, right? And I, in division two is where they where he's where he's starts to go into these notions of like inauthenticity and authenticity and freedom and these these kinds of these kinds of things. Maybe we could start to look at from in reading being in time. What's like what's what is going on with being inauthentic and what is going on with being authentic and why is that important right as it relates to time especially it's in in, in division two because they are straight you know it's interesting they're 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 very they they they've, the the two divisions feel very different to me right in in reading them they're obviously they're connected right in in deep ways but there's the there's something different going, you know. Well, I think what happens in Division Two, which is crucial, is that he and that already begins to come forth more and more towards the end of the first division. Is that Heidegger more and more speaks in his own language, hmm. or more and more speaks in the language that is. It shows itself as necessary in order to be able to, to try and articulate mm. being through Dasein. Mm -hmm. And as he warns himself um, towards the end of the introduction, he said the language will be unusual at times, just as Plato's and Aristotle's language was unusual. You know, we, we pretend like, oh, yes, of course, I know what how Plato means by forms and ideas, etc. But it wasn't that obvious to anyone at his time. Yeah. So I think the language shifts, and that's perhaps one of the most important moments of of the the two uh, mm -hmm. the divisions of the text. The way in which they connect is, I think, the heart of the text is death. And at the end of the first division, it's still unclear how how Dasein <clears throat> could be whole. And it is 
So finitude really needs to come in in order to provide structurally Dasein's wholeness. Because it is only through Dasein's wholeness that we can also have a, at least a glimpse of a response to being. Um, so we need a, a we need a possibility for wholeness. That's why death comes in as a as also as finitude at the beginning of the second division. Now to your question, the inauthentic. So th there seems to be a conflation, I think, also with scholars sometimes that being in the world somehow means you're authentically doing something. Being in the world can also mean that you're you're fallen for the world. You've fallen for the opportunities of the they self. So being in the world is a completely neutral term, yeah. but also inauthentic. The inauthenticity for Heidegger is also, I mean, technically speaking, is a neutral term. It's He says it has a positive result, the positive phenomenon. It's not derogatory. It's not a lesser state of being. That's at least what he says at the beginning of being in time. And so, however, it's a and Dasein is never fully authentic. It cannot be. Dasein is always at the same time in truth and in untruth, meaning it's always disclosed and also any disclosure leads to closure. So that the, you know, there's no moment when Dasein is enlightened and stands there as authentic and uh, is forever more authentic. No, it's, and if you want to no, no. jump in, go ahead. So the <clears throat> now, when it comes to to time, though the let's say there's there's the vulgar understanding of time, which is time is linear, time is passing now states. One now state, the future moves into the present, moves into the past. Boom, done. Maybe the past is of historiographical interest, and we read it in terms of oh, maybe we can learn something from history. So. But, Right. But the past itself has has no consequence, let's yeah. say. But no, but Heidegger would say the past doesn't cause the future, but the past is continuously being swept into the future. And the future also, at the same time, pushes back into that which has been, both continuously changing each other. So I think in terms of inauthenticity and authenticity, an inauthentic understanding of time would be to remain stuck with how we, again, how we perceive time, which is driven by the clock, which, by the way, you know, now that we're using iPhones, when I was a bit younger, um, and this is only 20 years ago, we already had uh, phones, mobile phones, but we didn't have there's nothing like a smartphone back then. And when you, you know, we used to, we used to, I don't know whether you did it, but we used to compare watches and what, what time do you have? Oh, yeah. I've got 2 p.m. I've, oh, I actually have 2 or 5. Yeah. It yeah. was never e even. And now, now with these, you know, horrendous things, it's like boom down to a nanosecond. Everyone's on the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and if some choker came along and just changed it for everyone, and, you know, if, they, if we could actually hack it, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. right, but, right. So it's boom down. Everyone's on the same time. We're doing this on a time zone here. Blah, 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 blah. So it's completely, it's even more structured in terms of inauthentic clock time. And inauthentic, why? Because inauthentic, not because it's normative or so, but because it takes away something from us mm -hmm. rather than giving something. Yeah. Ecstatic time, and I will, again, this is one of the most important yeah. aspects of time that we'll also very deeply discuss at the course is that time in its foundations, let's say, mm -hmm. ecstatic time, original time, gives. Mm -hmm. It arises and it gives. Yeah. And so it's not a false perception to say that time just passes us by, yeah. but it is inauthentic insofar as Dasein is here, is here yet still stuck in, in, a, in a mathematical understanding of time, in, in an understanding of time that can be measured, mm -hmm. but hasn't yet um, so I'm not, you know, but this will never go away. We have to, at the same time, accept somehow that, um, and Heidegger would have to accept this also, that 
the linear understanding of time is not going to go away. There can be, let's say, there can be moments, just like there are moments of authenticity where we really just come into our own. Mm-hmm. But then we fall again, you know, we, we come into, you know, you know, you, you come into your own and you, you're fully with it, whatever it is. And time also begins to feel different. Yeah. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, this is not something you can optimize for. Right. Right. It, it's, right. It, it can be gone the next minute. It can be just yeah. almost, almost that. And yeah. It's gone if you even notice it. And you fall again for the world. And of course, at the same time, when we fully disclose one of our, let's say, very authentic, own most possibilities, that at the same time crowds out or covers over other authentic possibilities. Mm-hmm. Right. So that the horizons continuously shift. And I think the more we begin to see it like this, the more there is a, an almost erotic play with 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 possibility. Mm. You know, not with this one directed like. This is the horizon. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. To walk toward this. No, no, no. So, uh, they, they, they shift. We shift. It, it. Yeah. Uh, erotic in the sense, really, that it's there is a there's a sense of eros of, um, yeah. of because eroticism has to do with with the erotic is about being only half revealed and, yeah. and half concealed, turned away, and not fully just you know spreading out, but and that. Is, so it's a, it's in of course arrows also in the sense of love, um, and so, so in that sense I would I would try and respond to that question on time so that there can be these moments you know we can say there are glimpses of eternity there are glimpses of where where time in some sense disappears but what time disappears clock time disappears yeah, yeah. and I think one of the issues that we that we have I mean you know what's a bit sad is that if you want to do metaphysics today. A student, I was in Bologna last week to give a lecture. And when they're very young students, they're all incredibly bright. But now, who knows what happens to them? But uh, one of them asked me, where can I study metaphysics? And I said, well, nowhere. It's done. Maybe you can go theology or physics, study physics. Because theoretical physics is the only place where you can still do metaphysics. But the issue with theoretical physics is that when they consider time, they purely think of it as a parameter. Mm-hmm. And of course, they will have crit- critiques of the parameter, they will have critiques of the clock, etc. They will have critiques of it, but they will usually just begin with already an assumed understanding of time, either as linear or as a, as clock time, as something that can be measured, even when they speak of it as a dimension, but, but never really as uh, ecstatically torn apart but also coming together. So I would think maybe the most, one of the most authentic ways of trying to be in time or with time, hmm. in time, not as place in it, but you know, really with time and along it, is to to understand that in this moment that something grants itself, which is afforded by time itself, as it were, that this is uh, that to well. Okay, to put it like this, to, to affirm such a moment and to be able to witness it and see it and accept it and mm. I don't know, go into it, be in it and be with it while it affords itself. Yeah. But, yeah. But you cannot, you know, okay, this is it. I'm going to yeah. hold on to it now forever. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so authenticity is a, is, is, is it fair to say, is not something that, um, one attains right but it's more like a mode that's more like a gift that's that that where that horizon like reveals conceals itself in such a way right that it it gives in that i like the the way the way that you're using arrows with this right of of this um yeah this this both this sense of this this the sense of reveal revealing that that is also revealing concealment right and this kind of wild place where when that when that opens up like that in those in those moments or those periods or those modes that you're in like it really is 
it really is like something speaking to you in some sense that that in abundance that um that easily slips away right it's not underneath your control like for example when a text speaks to you or or a horizon opens up you you never you hadn't seen before and it's and in some sense you're it it grabs your interest in in and takes you on a whole ride and time disappears, right? And you're right. At some point yeah. that closes, right? And you reify things and then you can't quite remember what it was that was so alive before, right? And th this kind of back and forth thing. So like in like in the way that Heidegger is addressing it in, in being in time, is there any way actually that one... I don't know, can, can not control it, not, not, um, not hack it or optimize it. But is there, is there any sense in that, in, in the text w where one can become continually more authentic or, or have more access to authenticity or is that like, is there any well, that's, uh... possibility for that in, in, in Heidegger? Maybe briefly on, on the first remark when you said, and I said this before also, when time disappears, I should say it again, you, that's in some sense striking, but that disappearance could just as well be considered the affordance of time itself. So actually time itself comes to the fore and it, what disappears is the ordinary understanding of time. Mm -hmm. So you see, this is perhaps also helpful in the in an attempt to respond to that question. Now, what, <clears throat> what we have to get rid of is an understanding of Dasein as a subject in any sense. And what we also have to <clears throat> uh, understand is that in, especially as Heidegger's thinking evolves and turns more and more towards the Greek, the Homer, for example, also, or to Heraclitus, there is no acting subject. There, there is simply there is simply that which occurs. Yeah. Now, however, we participate. Mm -hmm. We participate in the occurrence. It is the way in which we respond also to that which comes over us that also co-constitutes that which presents itself the presence of it so you know when you say say authentic it, it must not be taken in any way in the, any ordinary sense mm -hmm. as being more enlightened or blah, blah. but in a way um this is the you know so i think rather that perhaps one is most authentic when one understands and accepts that in the moment that something affords itself, let's say in a conversation, yeah. you, you could it could just as well slip away. And that there will be that something has been has disclosed itself. Yes, new aspects have shown themselves, but that must also include a disappearance of other aspects. Right. As it says before, a, a, an authentic possibility shows itself, affords itself, yeah. at the same time has to mean other just as authentic possibilities are covered over by this coming forth of that one possibility that is becoming, let's say, more concrete and then articulate. Yeah. So let's say maybe the most authentic way is to be most inauthentic in a sense or to be most accepting of the inevitability of the inauthentic. Right. That perhaps is what the text is pushing us towards. Right, right, um, right. So we're always simultaneously authentic and inauthentic. We're we're always uh, there's a certain you know it's it's a piety, mm. a certain humility. There's really it's a, it's 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 a certain piety really in a sense. And when it comes to thinking, I mean Heidegger is very often says that his thinking is poor. Being itself is poor. It's a poor thinking. It doesn't, right. it, as you know, I mean, you know, 
you have you read Herdelin or Goethe or Heidegger himself. I'm reading being in time again. <laughs> I don't know how many times um, I'm, I'm sure I certainly understand more now than when I read it the first time 12 years ago when I understood nothing but was still on fire yeah. reading it uh, but there's also a danger in in fooling one or deeming oneself to you know oh I understand more now because I I get all the references mm. I know when you know Hegel's really about because then one is in this scholarly mode of, oh, but this is wrong, and blah, blah, blah. And in, instead, so also the, you know, maybe in maybe authenticity is not, you know, a higher state, but almost more naive in some sense also. Yeah. Because you're, you're more, op more open to, hmm. to the initial, the inceptive, the other, when you don't know yet anything, when you actually have no idea what the hell is going on. So it's, in the easiest way you could say this is simply, once you reach a certain moment of authenticity, inauthenticity has already appeared. It's, it's already, and also because, you know, this is, has to do again with, with language and any sort of, you know, anything that's repeated, it becomes trite, becomes a cliche, becomes trodden in, in used up yeah 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 you, you know going into this so there's a certain so there's a certain in 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 authenticity there's there's a certain kind of humility right that yeah yeah right that very important that and a two it sounds like it's probably an, a, an attuning like piety or humility, because I always got that real sense of, in terms of Heidegger, that there is this, um, you know, thinking about authenticity, that there, there's this way where it's more like I, I picture, um, I don't know, correctly or incorrectly, just something like a, like a, a master woodworker, right, working with his wood, in, not in any productive sense, but in the sense of listening to the wood and the kind of wood, and you know, it may it may carve a certain groove, but the wood wants to do something else, and it responds to it. And there's a, you know, there's, I think in Heidegger there is there's a, um, I often just get kind of imagine him in these, yeah, in these the sense of a mastery in a, in a craft, or there's this possibility of this deep, these deep capacities that are more about listening, right? It's more about listening to the thing that you're working with, right? In, in that sense, right? Not like he's, an he's, airing, yeah. controlling or optimizing, uh, right? So, you know, there's this, this, this funny breed of um, professors of aesthetics, and very often they couldn't be further from anything that has to do with the arts, which is also, which are always also, especially in the fine arts, their crafts. And my father's a restorer. He's restored churches and castles and uh, frescoes such as the one you have an image of behind you all his life. And we read about 10 years together, we read the origin of the artwork. Hmm. And especially at the beginning, if you remember, the way in which he describes stones and timber hmm. and the materials, and the materials also as they are presented in paintings. And this is also why he can read poetry not as representational, it's because he sees in some sense the materiality of it. And the so to, to be able to describe craftsmanship like this, you have to be a craftsman yourself. You're not just using language externally as it were as a sort of instrument but you actually you know language becomes your is the is the timber let's say or the alabaster yeah 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 with which you carve yeah and 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 also not you know we're not throwing word things Right. At, at objects, and, and yeah. then we 
forever quibble about but you know are the properties of the object in the object or is it just in my representation oh let's analyze that representation a bit further and what do you end up with it's just a right. dissection of into nothingness into a void i mean this is basically all of empiricism in a nutshell right. and uh it ends up in the skepticism but here it is actually through and also not the language is not spoken really by us yeah i mean again after being in time this is coming out a lot more it's language is the world language is what moves the world so as we speak something appears in the way that it does when you know when you always just um, describe something as i guess i know all of that you never see it but the anything can can alight and emerge and arises um as at least not that beautiful of but but as something that is all of a sudden striking um and this is not a like some sort of you know hocus pocus but i, I think we we the the, it, the the language itself that if we listen to it it begins to disclose and so there's not a thing that's what i'm trying to say there's not a thing that we attach something to it or describe it and then we try and make sure that what we've said about it is actually corresponding to the thing. That's the question. No, but there's it, it's it's this moment uh, movement somehow that's at the same time going in this direction yeah. that we describe something and that something affords itself in a certain way. And as we describe it, it affords even more of itself, but also less of itself at the same time. Yeah. It, and then we're back with this. It it, it shows something of it. But at the same time, will hide yeah. something oh. else of itself. Also, in it that... necessarily has to. It has to. You know, there's there's no way you can just to give a very simple example. There's no way you can see the entirety of the cup ever. Totally. But in that dimension of withdrawing, <laughs> that dimension yes. of withdrawing, it, in some sense, it's it's it. it you know, I'm 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 thinking about. I graduated from the San Francisco Art Institute, um, which closed, by the yeah. way. It's just absolutely, I can't believe that it shut down. It's like, you know, 130 years old. shutting now. down. But in San Francisco. Yeah, yeah. But there is this way where, like, in, 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 when you're painting, you know, usually people think about, yeah. like, they were thinking about, like, going into a studio. They think of people, like, making marks on canvases and, like, doing all this activity but that's not actually what you see in those studios at all what you see is like people standing in front of the canvas looking at it like this and occasionally coming up and making a mark or 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 engaging with 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 painting or scraping something away or and then you stand back and then you have this relationship with it because there's this the mark when you go and make the mark there's always an intention with the mark. There's something that you want to do with the mark, but then you make the mark and then the mark, the marks, it speaks back. It pushes back in this way and something becomes more possible. And this possibility you thought was there kind of goes away. And it's this very living conversation that you're having right back and forth, but it's mostly kind of listening to it, listening to what opens up. And there is, it does seem like I would imagine that this in with this sense, this sense of authenticity seems to be um, if we want to say if if someone is someone more oriented towards these moments of authenticity, it seems like implicitly it's it's this deep relationship to concealment, that dimension that withdraws and your relationship to that dimension that withdraws. Um, realizing that in some sense you're subordinate to it like it either gives itself or doesn't give itself right yeah but it but but it authenticity is not a but it is not at this position yeah right? so it's not it's not it's not a it's not a state it's not a directedness yeah it's actually the moment in which certain possibilities are seen and accepted in a certain way yeah um that gives rise to that which is that which basically owns us in that manner you know eigentlich is 
uh, maybe also to be understood in that manner. So to become own, to it, it owns us. So we actually give ourselves up, yeah. in some sense, also. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say, I'm going to say something a bit provocative, but uh, maybe there's never been representational art. Mm. Mm. <laughs> that makes sense. So the, the, the usual, as you know, the ordinary story is uh, when when uh, um, photography was invented, the abstract art came about because there was no more place for representational art. Well, maybe the so-called self-portraits of Rembrandt and so portraits in the first place yeah maybe what they really are is there are moments of history that they're almost like they they stamp they actually in some sense make history i don't know uh they they, they encapsulate hmm. they don't encapsulate the moment but they 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 burn something they bring something to the fore Mm. of that moment about what it means to be uh, human mm. and that they're not oh i'm going to paint me myself in a representational manner mm. but, but it is in the face of das gesicht das gesicht in german so that, that which is seen that which has been seen it is in the face that we can see um, also certain historical unfoldings and moments so I wonder whether that maybe is not saying going too far, but mm. maybe it's never really been about just pure representation or anything of the sort, but actually trying to also show something that is covered over, but can only be said or shown in art, yeah. as for example, a portrait, mm. or as for example, um, a seeming, you know, just a landscape or something. Obviously, there are massive paintings um that you know, even by by john by by, by joseph turner uh, which will be which he will have painted <clears throat> for his clients because they wanted to have just a, a landscape uh, painting but even that landscape painting brings let's say the landscape of england to light in a way that lets the landscape itself mm. um mm. Right. come forth in a different manner right so and if and so with, with authenticity i know there's two different topics now but i think it's it's it's, it's never a disposition so um yeah. it's actually it's, it's actually more giving up on oneself but i think the danger is to to uh to assume that in just on a personal level that one has reached that uh that state because it's actually in, in that because the authentic cannot be separated from the inauthentic. It is, and even even something that begins to you know, to be, oh yeah, he's you know, he's he's really doing what he's supposed to do. Look at him. You know, you can sense it when someone is in it. Yeah. But that that very that that can become also again trite, sterile, dead, and it's, nothing's changed except for perhaps a, a, a certain closing off to that this was never once owned to begin with but that it's owned i mean this is all going way beyond being in time but that it actually owns us in a certain it takes over yeah yeah in that and that you could want to say being available to be taken over um i'm just i'm struck in this conversation about and I've always been struck by this, but in some, in some way, it's revealing itself in this in this dialogue that's yeah. it's, it's deepening deepening for me of of that openness to be struck in that way is really is in this you could say is a um, a deep there's a real deep relationship it seems that that with concealment with that that i didn't i didn't just conquer this thing right it's not my will in some sense that's 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 um creating something but there's a that there's that 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 most likely it's not going to come in some way right and that concealment is part of is part of the deal 
but that kind of openness to that concealed dimension or an attunement to it or an orientation to it or or the way it orientates you right um seems to seems to be maybe one of the ways that like someone someone can start to become more and more available to when it opens up right is is this well, see, this relationship to concealment as such or withdrawal as, as such yeah but at the same time you know open to what i mean what he, he that has to have content so yeah. um for example what what did this what that could actually bring to the forum much more than anything authentic or wonderfully blessed or enlightened is is the exact opposite is let's say horror or is is the utterly uncanny that i mentioned of concealment or withdrawal those are not um those are eerie let's say mm. in this beautiful old english word eerie mm. You can already hear you know, in English. You can always hear what it means. <laughs> eerie. It has a weird sound to the eerie. Yeah. So that eeriness of of concealment shouldn't be forgotten. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, if, if so, authenticity doesn't. You know, someone's let's just say to make a very almost crude example, but someone's almost possibilities might be really awful. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, it, it's not. Oh, well, yeah. What's own most to someone could be. I'm not going to say hey, you're going to give an example, but it could be something utterly horrendous. Right. Also, so authentic is a completely neutral term. Yeah, yeah. It's, really, it's, it's utterly neutral. It, it doesn't. It doesn't have any value, uh, normative value to it. It doesn't mean good or higher or more enlightened. And so, at this, let's say, an orientation towards it would 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 actually lead to more of a humility, right? Yeah. Uh, because withdrawal means withdrawal. Yeah, withdrawal means either it means withdrawal or it means nothing. So it has to mean it's slipping. We need to slip, let slip something away, and that means also one's uh, one's own beliefs about oneself. Yeah, uh, for yeah. example. So that that I think is 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 crucial, mm -hmm. and it it. I mean, this is. <laughs> the, the focus or the was. Heidegger is, I think, struck by this the, the dimension of withdrawal and concealment as well. And as he's struck by it, he begins to investigate it. And as he investigates it, everything slips away. And at the same time, he, he, he I think, he can see the, the the scope of technology and what it threatens. Yeah. Precisely because he can see what it conceals yeah. while it reveals. Yeah. And when we come back to so. You know, there's always this quote that Heidegger gives and that many refer to, sorry, which is from Hölderlin, where there is uh, danger there also that which saves or protects is growing. Mm. But you have to read that backwards as well. Where that which protects or saves, there is danger also. Yeah. So yeah. Th 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 it's not one, it's not danger, but then we'll be fine. Yeah, we just have to go through technology, and then ah, you know, we're we're going to heaven, as in your painting. But right. no, it's where, where there is that which saves us. There is danger. Yeah, yeah. So 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 maybe you know a way of um, trying to be attempting, aspiring to be, in some sense, in a vernacular sense, authentic would be would be a complete acceptance that in the moment in which. There is a disclosure in which I participate. There's also closure and concealment and withdrawal, which that cannot be gotten rid of. And at the same time, uh, yeah, that 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 so that collapse is also yeah. inbuilt, as it were, and and then revealing itself is a danger. Right. Right. Some things maybe remain best remain unsaid. <laughs> yeah. Totally. No, I mean, so, so, so the, 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 the date, and I think it's, that's for another time, maybe to discuss why such words as authenticity or enlightenment, uh, et cetera, have such appeal. Um, but, but the danger, yeah, when Heidegger speaks of the danger, it's something very benign. It's revealing. Mm. 
Mm. Revealing is the danger. It's not. It's not the big mega machine, the right. big mega uh, technic te- te- techno pharaoh coming with his monster uh, pyramids, killing everyone. Term, term, I mean, you know, people who think that AI is anything, you know, to be concerned about. They've just watched too many movies. Those are metaphors. Term, Terminator is one big bloody metaphor. It's just, you know, get a sense. Yeah. But what 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 the danger the danger is revealing itself and that's that's what being is being itself is the danger so we're always in touch with danger right it's, it's not so it's not something big and nefarious that you can imagine it's something very small something very almost it's inconspicuous yeah yeah interesting <laughs> well you know it's one thing I wanted to ask you about like kind of going back to the first time you read Being in Time. I think I've, I've yeah. heard about this before that you felt fortunate. You felt fortunate because you really didn't, you kind of, when you read it, you, you really didn't have any preconceptions I, or or something like, do, do you remember what, what was it like for you kind of reading Being in Time? Did it kind of like light was an experience of like something lit on fire in you? And what is it? And I guess my so, yeah. It's about also what is it this reading now that you're doing you know, doing this class? What do you, what are you hearing that you didn't hear the first time, or what, what is that difference? And oh, I'm I'm yeah. And this is very special this time because this is the first time. I mean, I've written a book on, in parts on being in time. Uh, and you know, you write papers on it. I I taught university courses on being in time, but I've never sort of developed a course that is completely free from any of those constraints. The first time I read Being in Time was I think in two thousand nine or ten, oh. during summer break of the university. I started reading it. It took me I don't know two two years. I mean, with breaks because in between, you know, you have to. Mm-hmm. I had to finish other things, so I read it on my own. And back then, luckily, luckily I say this, uh, there was there was I had almost I, I didn't really use, I mean I used the internet like you used the internet, but now it wasn't big internet as it's now it's like everywhere. So I had to read it on my own. I probably didn't. I the Greek was there. That is so that re- re- referencing the stretching back to play to right on in the very beginning that is uh, that probably sparked it also for me mm-hmm. and also in the, in a sense you know this thinking is not that foreign to if you are if you go to what the Italians call liceo classico a classical lyceum in Europe which they are now going extinct where you read latin and you read uh, greek a grammar school in England that would be a humanitarian gymnasium in Germany. So that that way of thinking is is you know you, you you're used to it, and it's it was beautiful to see this explicated in a way that made it so alive. Also, mm. Mm. and if it the text feels very alive, it, it's it's mm-hmm. on fire, as I said before, mm-hmm. and now. As I'm, I have been developing the course, and you have to go over what you what you leave out, what do you focus on, how do you tie that together with everything else. It's the Dasein disappears even more, as it were. Mm. So you know, in the maybe the first reading, I don't remember, but maybe I was imagining someone or something or so doing something, but that's gone. It's it, it's it's now really a, a horizon, but I'm in, in more concrete terms. What I'm beginning to see is that the text is <clears throat> is uh, an exercise in destruction. That means a, a a taking apart, but also reappropriating appropriating the the tradition in such a way that the tradition becomes you know it's not deconstruction. So you don't build it down Mm -hmm. so that either nothing remains or just gobbledygook Mm -hmm. (laughs) but you you it's it's an appropriation of the tradition that lets the tradition also have its 
it has its rights, yeah. it has its place. Yeah. But we appropriate it in such a way that we take, we can take on, and this comes back to authentic, inauthentic. Uh, also, we 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 appropriate it in such a way that it become it can become our own, mm. instead of, you know, ending up with saying, well, you know, you're just a hackable animal, mm -hmm. because all you are is a heap of data, which is basically David Hume run amok mm -hmm. when he says that the self is just a a, a lump. Right of of uh, impressions. Right, right. You know, I mean, the self understanding of 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 certain uh, individuals who are very powerful and influential yeah. is that human beings are data heaps and they can be mined. So the big, you know, corporations they know more about you than you. Huh. Well, maybe it was never about self knowing. Maybe it was exactly that that it, you know maybe the human being isn't just the um, the sum of. Of search uh, entries mm -hmm. and so but this is exactly i think what happens when when the basis for how we understand ourselves breaks away and that has happened obviously and it has exhausted itself so okay. now the time is and that's that's how i read it now is on the one hand yes the question of being the question of time crucial but at the same time how does this now does it now translate into our century and I think you know now we're even more open to books like this because it's more pressing now. It's, the issue is becoming clearer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And so this is. So in what way would you say if if, it's, if it makes sense to talk about it like this? This um. Yeah, I, I well, one I just appreciated what you said of like yeah, first reading being in time maybe design like was more like a a special thing of some kind or an entity yeah, like someone, yeah, yeah. someone or something and now it's <clears throat> you don't have that picture has gone away <laughs> and and that, and now that you're teaching yeah. not with the constraints of the university right and just the way that you laid out your lectures with this one is it like was your experience of kind of like did you have kind of an insight on how to lay it out right or or was there anything surprising in it like right you know as you as you did the first lecture something opened up that you didn't quite see that you realized that affected the second one and like how, what what's been the process of of actually like laying out the course um i from the beginning i i i skipped over and i've left it that way everything on everydayness uh, precisely because if we focus too much on it, these are entry points to the ontological. If we focus too much on it, this, as you know, in the first division of being in time, then we can very quickly understand it just as, you know, this is someone doing something in their life world. Yeah. Like a so by taking... Yeah. Yeah. Don't mention his name. No, I'm kidding. I mean, the, the issue with Dreyfus and, and his acolytes, his students, is that the foundation is lacking, mm -hmm. you know? So the, the foundation, I mean, he's, I don't know, frankly, I have no idea whether he was a philosopher or not, or whether he was a computer scientist, or whatever he was. I mean, so people can uh, blame me for that. But I mean, by foundation, even if you have a PhD in philosophy, if it's analytical philosophy, mm -hmm. and born from, from that history lessness of positivism, yeah, you know this this explicit attempt at destroying history, at turning everything to into into a formula, yeah, and then also the lack of language. I mean, you, yeah. you have to have some access to, at least as a teacher, you have to have some access not as the reader, but as the teacher. I think you you need to understand the German. You need to understand the Greek. If you don't, the basis is it's just it's not going to come. It, you, the way you will read it is exactly what we see here. It's yeah. like it's some sort of psychiatry, some sort of social philosophy. Yeah. Uh, it, it just the, the language is is distorting everything. And so, what did um, <clears throat> I think it was more of a, of a in terms of the reading, but really it's a section six of the introduction, crucial, just on destruction. Uh, 
which I think is occurring again and again throughout the text where we can see him engaging with the tradition, mm-hmm. tradition of philosophy, that's what's always important to say, mm-hmm. and reappropriating it in such a way that mm-hmm. it is now speaking to us. Yeah. And yeah. And <clears throat> so that's what, so the, the, say the roadmap for the course was done very quickly because there are these themes that just emerge that are important. The the difficulty is always how you how you can somewhat you know touch on everything while at the same time sorry uh focusing on on everything that's that's that is crucial without maybe um uh you, know, you, you cannot cover um everything you cannot cover everything in your first reading or in your second reading you will you, you read the book in its totality but you will then go back to certain parts of it but but it will still emerge as a whole because i think what 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 what, what i think we will be able to see going through the text together is 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 really the question of being itself emerging i think there is also at least an initial attempt at a response to the question of being in time. Yeah. And so, and that all has to do with how we read it. So yeah. thinking is to do with, well, not with images um, or quick imaginations or so, but it's in a sense, it, you, you know, the, the familiar becomes unfamiliar. It gives you nothing to represent or imagine. But yeah, so there's structure and there's also I have a sort of the, the focus in the beginning really is also on, on the, the stretching back to and, and referencing of Plato. And that we are now, and maybe you remember this from the early days of my channel, I put out a video a few years ago on the gigantic battle of being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And this is yeah, he, he's that serious. He says this is a gigantic battle of being that's and it's this is not solved by doing metaphysics in academia. Yeah. This is this means that what it means to be is now at stake. Right. And that's 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 real. Let's just say that's that's real and it's being fought out every single day. Yeah. yeah. And in now in, in a in a time of hyper mediality, of big internet, of simulation upon simulacrum <laughs> wrapped in God knows what. Right. Uh, right. Trying to cut through to uh, the real right. is crucial. And also, I think I was also more appreciative now of in section seven on on the method of phenomenology of how incredibly precise he is when he describes the difference between phenomenon, <clears throat> semblance, appearance, and mere appearance. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so... Right, so the, a way so it's an intense rereading, yeah. yeah, in a way that directly speaks to us in this time. It's yeah, it's so interesting. I thought um, I I happened to come across uh, a like a two. It's like a two hour. I guess it was a spontaneous conversation with um, Elon Musk um, on on the. I guess Twitter has one of those as a way of, of having kind of um, audio, audio conversations. And he was, he was in his plane and he just talked for like two hours. And it's interesting because with Musk is, is, is in some sense, listening to Musk is in some sense, like probably, probably the most direct access or concentrated access that you have to this whole thing about, about tech, like in framing and technicity. Right. And one of the things I, in that conversation I thought was so striking um, was when he he was making a reference to basically his what he thought it, 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 like his worldview, his sense of the whole of like why human beings are here. And he says, essentially, he says it's a it's a explicit. He said it, this is we're 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 here to, to be curious. Right. We're in and in, in, in that there's essentially which presupposes I had this sense of it presupposes is like that that 
the universe or being is a whole set of problems, right? Um, awaiting for us to come along and and be curious about them and solve the problems in some sense, right? <laughs> and I, I thought about that difference between like the, the sense of wonder and the sense of curiosity, which are not even on the same on in the same universe, right? In a big way. But I thought that was really it was really quite striking, you know. It's it is striking how this is always so derivative. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you if you rephrase this a bit, it becomes to him meaningless. And to us probably more beautiful, which is yeah, we are here to stand in awe in the face of cosmos. Right. And we are here to articulate it also. And this is indeed a task that is cosmic, yeah. but it is going beyond, you know, cosmic in the sense, you see, we have to go to Mars. Mm. That's, that's a sort of, it, it's a derivative response to the cosmic task. Yeah. It, and so <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, to, if when you, you know, Karl Popper uh, wrote this short essay or a book, entitled all of life is problem solving mm. well you know at the end of it nothing's left i mean once you've solved all the problems yeah yeah is what well okay done <laughs> right and then we just and then we just well you know now we're done yeah guess we can just kind of die out <laughs> uh and so it's it's always derivative of of of, of yeah of, of who we are and i think what with musk is fascinating though is that i don't you know i don't think he's wrong i think that or, or that he's misguided i think that um you said it i think you said it yourself anyways but i'll just say it again uh it said with him we can actually uh, get a sense for he's very near to the site to cybernetics he's very near to what that is that we call technology or techniques or so yeah. So we can actually yeah, there's a lot to be learned from that. Yeah. But it but it might just be that this leads to <clears throat> now again coming back to consumer withdrawal, etc. To something very unforeseen for almost everyone involved. Uh, we're only at the beginning of this. Yeah. You know, this is not even we're not even close to the beginning, actually. Yeah, because with you and I, I just realized this last week when I spoke to the, the students at Bologna after you know, after the lecture, they come up and they talk to. You, I realized afterwards that what I'm doing now didn't exist three years ago. Mm. If you so, this is 2022 in 2019 mm -hmm. in December. I was a, I taught a bit at university. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's it. And maybe, maybe I can somehow, you know, as they call it, monetize um, my videos. Mm -hmm. But that's that's a complete, you know, non-starter. You you just become a content machine, right? But to 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 be able to try and, you know, with all the the risk and and uh, and, and everything that comes with it, but so at the same time to to, to as you know, scholar leisure mm -hmm. are, are fundamental to, to to thinking, to be to be to have any openness, mm -hmm. and so to be able not to live machine like, but still through the internet. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm yes, I'm offering. I mean, if you look at it in a derivative way, offering courses, making videos, blah, blah, blah. but but also shooting like flashes through the cybernetic system that you you don't know what they lead to at the other end or what there is no other end right uh i don't know who i don't know who listens to me but it's certainly i'm not giving out any information but it somehow changes people and it brings them together we just ended the hegel course yesterday and i list i, I joined the session and some of the students towards the end and i've actually picked this up now mm -hmm. said you know uh, i saw moments of eternity <laughs> mm -hmm. right right Right. And, yeah. I, and I guarantee, sorry, but I guarantee you, if they had taken a Hegel course at university, that would not have happened. No, it would not. Yeah, they wouldn't have said that. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, and, and I didn't teach the course. I'm not uh, tooting my own horn here. This was uh, Philip Niklas, who you also know, uh, taught the course. So not me. I'm, I was just listening. So, and I, you know, this three years ago, we, we knew each other already back then, but this didn't exist. I mean, surfing didn't exist 25 years ago, 20 years ago before you came up. But now it's gone into, it's going into its next um, uh, direction, these things. And, and that is with the internet. And we have, I think, absolutely no idea yet what it will do to us but also how it can be in some sense really liberating yeah um yeah freeing but at the same time of course also terribly enslaving and one-dimensional but all at once and i think we're really just at the at the very 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 early stages of a complete explosion and we have no this will be I mean, 10 years ago, yes, people watched videos on YouTube. They were mostly cat videos. Then all of a sudden, I actually listened to some conversations, but they were still between scholars. So I remember, you know, studying in, in Italy. I listened to some of the big names. I forgot now, of course, in in theory of international relations. John Mearsheimer comes to mind. When he's now persona non grata. Someone shouldn't say his name. I just did. I'm sorry. And others uh, who were... But those were established scholars, mm. you know. Th- those were professors, and, and then the first university started putting out their podcasts and everything. But now we're in a in a moment where it it is, you know, it, this opens up also possibility for philosophy that maybe someone like Heidegger didn't see. Because Heidegger, in some sense, that's what I would hold against him. Is that he resign? There's a certain resignation. Mm-hmm. Right. 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 I mean, he had to do a lot of preparatory work, right? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, obviously, like he, 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 for him, the, the great fire was was gone; it was extinguished. Mm-hmm. But he was, he still there's a certain resignation at the end of philosophy, as he says, and, and philosophy becomes cy- cybernetics, which is a bit very reductive. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it it could just be that. Uh, Philosophy, which is to say the saving of phenomena, is now in some sense you know, realigning in a way that we have no idea what's going to happen. And uh, lives will be lived in a way that can be terrifyingly um, slave, sl- slavish. Mm-hmm. That's the word, the word slaving, sorry. But, but at the same time, also in, in an accelerating way, uh, uh, liberating. Yeah, uh, and all through and all, but but I think it comes down then to to under, uh, <clears throat> understanding what the this comes back to with you know, circling around what is the ground for this, what sort of what what affords itself, and also the the playful openness to the the shifting horizons. Yeah, that you yeah. know, so the ossification of institutions. That the, the mechanism of institution is, you know, the ac- ac- academia. Students come in; they're full of life mm-hmm. in their first year, and then after two years, because they want to be philosophers, they realize: well, in order to be a philosopher, I have to write papers and publish. So they look at this; they see these you know, the, the mechanics of it, and then they become mechanics themselves. Yeah, yeah. In order to achieve that goal, so it, it, the institution itself, in that way, has ossified. Yeah. Uh, and has sort of exhausted itself also because young people full of life they come in and then it becomes one directional how can i be a, a philosopher or a, a literary critic or you know some scholar of some sort in the arts and the humanities well by publishing by doing this. but that in some sense it, it will go on but there's also now other paths where yeah, I'm going off a bit, but you know, kind of tangent here. But the there could be a way of you know, even though the machine now seems all encompassing, that is actually less machinic. Yeah, huh. is that it's in some say freer. You know, yeah. we've been talking about this many times. How we've had discussions that are three hours long. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, and this no, this format didn't exist. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, let's sit down and have a conversation about Hegel uh, mm-hmm. for forty-five minutes, and it's chopped up into 
sound bites, but not these long form that people have to sit down and listen to it. And not everyone will do that, obviously, but yeah, uh, because they have their own lives to live, but some will. Yeah. Uh, and that also affords them with an invitation to learn how to listen. And that also grants us, you know, someone who comes from academia where everything you say is, you know, has to be yeah. on point. But, you know, maybe, and I'm doing this with my lectures right, just now, I'm saying, some of them are written and some of them are completely free. Yeah. And I'm not, so, you know, I'm not editing out when, when I have to think. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. it, it comes to me, so I'm reading it. I'm reading it before I go to record it, and then I sit down and read it again. And while I'm reading it out loud, all of a sudden, something strikes me. I have to. Something opens up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that you know that is unthinkable. Um, yeah. Not within old academia. In academia it used to be like this also, but right. it's unthinkable usually because it it's becomes so machine like very often. Totally. I'm um, sorry. So, so to yeah. be able to go like literally like kind of like to 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 have the freedom to essentially move where thought moves right and have this course be be the site of that yeah, to, to, yeah but look but look now you said something crucial in, in terms of really of a, an, on a almost like a cosmic level forget the course <laughs> to but move the where way, thought I have, moves I have to get going just a, a few minutes but just yeah cut cut me off. So uh, to to I, I don't know this to go where thought moves that that might be what's about to you know because we're all thinking I mean, think about how many people are thinking about what the hell is going on at the moment but what is technology all of this and it's all moving at light speed or fiber optic speed of the internet mm-hmm. and so maybe we are really moving into a you know really different thought realm altogether yeah yeah and that's where philosophy has to find her place yeah totally which seems like a really good place to to complete i'll have all the, I'll have the information about the course coming up in the show notes um i want to encourage everyone to, to um if you feel moved by anything in this conversation like go take the course and i'll see you there thank you very much guy All right. Great to everyone else. Thank you. As always. Bye-bye. Bye.